Yes, it's another beautiful day in one of the most beautiful countries on Earth. Good morning, Vietnam! I love this country, but I've never, ever travelled on one of their planes. Vietnam is home to an extraordinary 1,000-mile-long railway. The driver is smoking a pipe. That's over 100 years old. The seat is now so hard, the ventilation is non-existent. But in a country that's low on cash and tight on space... This is so scary. How did this railway survive one of the bloodiest wars the world has ever seen? And how much longer can it last? At this speed, we should be there in about six months. They call it the Reunification Express. But can a train really unite a country that was so bitterly divided? My journey begins in Ho Chi Minh City. Once called Saigon, it's home to over 8 million people. And they all seem to be out on the streets this morning. I'm trying to get across Ho Chi Minh City in the rush hour to catch a train. I've never, ever been in traffic like this in my life. It's just a complete free for all. They don't stop for anything. Zebra crossings is having a laugh. This is no system. Oh, stop tooting. Even if you've never been here before, you feel like you have because of all those war movies like Apocalypse Now and The Deer Hunter. I've never been so glad to see a station in my life. You're a very nice man. The North won the war, of course, but I can't say Ho Chi Minh City feels particularly communist today. The communist victors insisted on changing the name of this place to Ho Chi Minh City, but actually, it still says Saigon. Hello. Uh, can I get a ticket to Dian, please? When you want to go. As soon as possible, please, the next train. Yeah. Thank you. OK. Uh, 13,000 big numbers. 13,000 dongs. Bargain. I think that's um, about a quid. I've never spent dongs before. It's rather exciting, isn't it? Thank you. I'll get change. Thank you. And my ticket? You wait on the train now. Thank you. Now? OK, thank you. I've no idea. I seem to have got hard, no air con. I do hope I haven't over-economised. Yeah, you can get soft, you can get hard, you can get full air conditioning. I assume you got the cheapest possible. You'd think being in a communist country, all train seats would be the same, wouldn't you? Number four, on down. Thank you. Right to the end, comrade Tarrant. Is that the one? Really hard seat, no air con. Oh, great. Oh, thank you. Oh, good. God forbid I should sit in the wrong seat and get arrested. Hello. <laughs> trying to find my seat. What they say about hard seats? Apparently there are also hard sleeper seats. Ah, this is actually... This is my seat. I've never actually done a railway film yet where I'm sitting with a baby... Oh! And actually a mummy and another baby under my seat. <laughs> it's all right? This is surreal. We're off. The first leg of my journey on the 1,072-mile North-South Railway from Ho Chi Minh to Hanoi. This morning, I'm heading to D An to look at some of the country's last surviving steam locomotives. Then I go in search of an old mountain railway line built by the French colonials. Before travelling to the place where the first US combat troops landed in the Vietnam War. I'll cross over the High Van Pass to the demilitarised zone 
where I'll help with the ongoing post-war clear-up. Then I'm heading further north to visit an indestructible bridge before reaching the capital, Hanoi. They call this the Reunification Express because after the Vietnam War, it basically links up the whole of the country. It is called Express. I think that's a bit of a misnomer. It's doing about 20 miles an hour. Construction of the line began in 1899 when Vietnam was a French colony. The French were here for over 60 years, so I'm keen to see what mark they've left on the railway. So far, it doesn't look as though much has changed in a very long time, including the third-class carriages. They really are so hard. Luckily, we're only travelling one stop. I want to get off at Dian because there's quite a nice bit of Vietnam railway history. And here we are. Did I mention it's the rainy season? Somewhere here, I'm going to meet a guy who's created his own monster task for himself. He's going to build his own steam railway. That's quite wet now. Oh, look at this stuff. Yeah. Just outside Ho Chi Minh, this is the main railway maintenance depot in South Vietnam. It's also home to some of the country's last surviving steam locomotives, which a team led by New Zealand entrepreneur Mike Gebby is working hard to restore. Your staff, presumably, are all local, are they all? Yeah, they're all local. That's right, yeah, no foreigners. Apart from you. <laughs> and are they good? Are the Vietnamese good workers? Yeah, they're very good, very practical. They're nice very people. Can we go and look at one of the trains? Yeah, sure. This is a class 141, a type of locomotive used here from the 1940s. Beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. It's a Vietnamese design based on the old French Mikados. We managed to find the last three in Vietnam, so we've renovated two, and, uh, and we've got a third one in 1,000 parts. Today, Mike's agreed to take me for a test drive of his Revolution Express. Hi, guys. Hi, oh, yeah. Oh, mind my head, yeah. Hello, I'm Chris. How are you? These locomotives were first used to serve the French Empire, but later were operated by the North Vietnamese during the war and well into the communist era. This would be a really big deal for the, for the locals as well as tourists, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, I'm, I'm really getting some positive feedback from yeah. local Vietnamese. They love to see their history. Yeah. It's, it's almost as if they've moved too quickly to the future, so we're, we're trying to bring everyone back a bit. Mike plans to run his steam trains through the stunning central highlands of Vietnam. But today it's just a tour of local D and suburbs. Um, backwards. Yeah, I think time for you to earn your salary. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Pleasure. I've already Let done that on a motorbike. Yeah. What do you do? Put a bit of coal in, I'll open the plane. Oh. I was quite warm until you did that. Now I'm absolutely I've got the easy boiling. Well done. That is on fire, isn't it? This fine old loco is certainly raising some local eyebrows and terrifying the local cows. It's really what everybody comes out. I suppose most of them have never seen a steam train, have they? No, they all wait. the young ones, for certain. Yeah, that's amazing. It's just fantastic. Hey, listen, very much. I'd yeah, love to come back yeah. when it's working. I'd love to. It's been great to have you on board. Chris. Good fun. I think this actually goes faster than the Reunification Express. I certainly hope so, with you shoveling. OK, take care. Thank you. Yeah, take care, Chris. The Revolution Express is going to be a fine addition to the Vietnamese railways, but back at Guardian, I'm already having my doubts about the remaining 1,059 miles of my journey. It sounds very grand, but already I'm not very keen to get back on the Reunification Express and those lovely bone-hard seats. At least this time I've splashed out on a hard seat with aircon, if I can find it. And it's right up the end of this carriage, which is the bar. Oh, good. Dear, oh, dear. They look a bit loud. Hello. 
Hello. Hello. Talking about the reunification railway. I think this is going to be the intoxication railway. I'm now heading along the coast to Tap Cham, where I hope to find an old colonial railway that leads up into the mountains. I think I've worked out where this train is travelling at the speed of a tortoise. It's a really old, bumpy, single track. And when a train comes the other way, one of us has to stop to let the other pass. To pass the time, they're organising a competition to win a goldfish in a bag. Oh, no! That's lunch. Like the British, the French had a widespread empire. In this part of the world, they ruled in Vietnam, Cambodia and Laos. But they also found the sultry heat almost unbearable. So they built a series of mountain retreats, little towns way up in the hills. So tomorrow we head for the hills, and I'm hoping the catering will get a whole lot better in the place they call the Little Paris of Vietnam. Day two, the sun is shining, and I'm on the trail of an old branch line into the mountains. I know most of it isn't running anymore, but I'm hoping for spectacular remains. Ah, and actually, if you look down there, that's clearly... Oh, that's good. That's clearly the old railway bridge. It's the rusting remains of a railway bridge built back in the 1920s. So I'm on the right track. I think the mountain railway itself actually began from up here in a place called Songthar. Hello. I'm trying to find the old the Songthar, the station. OK. Uh, you, I follow you? No oh, thank you. Good. I think I'm being kidnapped. Trouble is, oh, none of my kids will pay the ransom. Hello, we'll just go forward. Oh, just in time for the rain. Oh, this is surreal. So, thank you. Is this, this is the station area? Dalak. So that's the Dalak Mountain. So you can see it, look, really clearly from here. It's so steep as well. That is the mountain that they built going right the way up the top to Dalat. This must be the station. It's actually now somebody's house. God, look at this. Hello. It's not quite the, um... It's not quite the grand French colonial building I was hoping for. This has got to be it, though. Very kind of them to just let me wander around. Oh, look! Tiny dogs, little tiny chicks. I'm sure when they built this a hundred years ago, they weren't expecting it to be overrun with little baby chickens. But there's still no tracks. So I think, actually, this is probably the station. It seems to have a bigger sort of platform look about it. It's obviously this lady's house. So that over there, the first bit, must be like, I don't know, a shed, a maintenance area or something. And the trains then come out to the station here and then go up the hill. From here, the French faced a towering challenge. So they brought in Swiss engineers to build a rack and pinion railway, rising almost 1,400 metres in just 27 miles, carrying sweaty French people to their mountain retreats. But these days, only one section remains, the home straight at the top of the hill. This is wonderful. I found some track and a train and a station that's sort of cleanish and isn't full of chickens. This is more like it. Thank you. This is smart. And guess what? Wooden seats. We're off, and I can almost smell those 1930s croissants. This train, but it's diesel. I was kind of hoping for steam. And there's no rack and pin here, it's just an ordinary track. We're passing through rich farmland, but if you were hoping for vistas of sun drenched paddy fields, sorry. This area is really famous for producing vegetables and plants. 
and all the way around us you can see all sorts of flowers, all sorts of veg growing, mainly under cover, obviously, because of the climate. Finally, we're entering the city of Dalat and its 1938 Art Deco station. So this is Dalat, it's rather nice actually, very clean, beautifully painted, much cooler, probably 15 degrees cooler than when we were down at the bottom. This is nice, the big sign here, Cog Railway, there's an old locomotive here, but this is obviously the only bit left of the old Cog Railway track. From 1907, the French built hotels, grand colonial houses, and even a mini Eiffel Tower radio mast. During World War II, as the capital of French Indochina, it became known as Petit Paris. And I found a lovely old cafe. Why is it, even when I come into a little cafe, I still get a hard wooden seat? This is rather nice, French cafe, very French. Vin Rouge, baguette. The French influence is felt all over Vietnam, but after independence, it all descended a bit into chaos. And the Geneva Conference in 1954 divided the country into two. The North became communist and the South pro West. But Ho Chi Minh wanted the whole country, the whole of Vietnam, to be communist. And this was a nightmare prospect for the South Vietnamese, but also particularly for their number one ally, the Americans. Tomorrow, I'm heading back to the coast and the place where the mess left behind by the French became an unwinnable American war. Day three, back on the Reunification Express. These regulations, getting on a train in Vietnam, are just truly wonderful. Intoxicated persons, insane people, People who have infectious diseases, they're not allowed. You get priority queuing, sick soldiers, pregnant women, uh, elderly people from 60 years or older. I might just squeeze into that one. And finally, things you can't put in your hand luggage include human bodies or their remains. You're not allowed to take them on. Maybe my senior status has helped because I seem to have moved up in the communist pecking order. This should be better, because on my ticket it says no hard seat, a soft seat and air con. Ooh, uh, thank you. Yeah, that's extreme step. Right, now for my lovely soft seat. Just look at that scrum there. <laughs> Somewhere amongst all that is my seat. Today I'm heading for Da Nang, a key city in the history of the Vietnam War, or the American War as it's known here. I think we'll be at Da Nang before we actually get a seat. Hello. Oh. Hello. Oh. Right, now I can settle. This is good. Cozy, aircon. We've even got a plug for electricity. It's good. We're slowly edging towards the heartlands of the war. So, how did the Vietnam War come about? Well, after the French left and it was divided north and south, the US began to get nervous. They were worried that if the south fell to the communists, other countries might follow suit, as what they called the domino theory. From the 1950s, American support for the French-backed South gradually escalated with so-called military advisers and then air support until finally in 1965, the first US Marines landed at Da Nang Beach, where tomorrow I'm going to meet an American veteran who is still living in Vietnam. Da Nang, an important port, a beautiful beach, and the point of no return for the Vietnam War. The first American troops landed here on the 8th of March, 1965. There was no real opposition, though. There were just beautiful Vietnamese ladies carrying garlands of flowers. And the Americans thought it would just be a walk in the park, and the boys would all be home in time for Christmas. How wrong they were. 
Ten years of relentless, brutal bombardment, chemical warfare, all sorts of atrocities and millions dead, fighting a war they couldn't win. The last thing you'd really expect from an American soldier who served in the 60s was that he'd ever come back to Vietnam. But we can go one better. We talked to a guy who's actually moved back and lives in Vietnam. James R. Nelson, who served here in 1966 and 67, is going to tell me how it all went wrong. Nelson, can you remember the first time you arrived at Saw, Vietnam? I remember seeing the landscape, the banana trees and the palm trees and all that, and everything looked pretty normal. But the, the real impact, the real first impact on me but that I was in a place that was really different was when we were in the terminal, and I looked around me and I realized that for the next year, my full tour of duty here, I would never be quite certain who was friend and who was foe. Did you get a sense, even the short time you were here, that the, the American bombing, etc., cetera, was, was kind of excessive? Well, sure, although it got a lot more excessive after I left. That's when things really changed from an ordinary nasty war to a bizarre, almost insane war. I'm sure no one ever thought we'd be here as long as we were. What do you think was the worst thing that the Americans did during the war? I think it was the Agent Orange. Really? Yeah. Agent Orange was used as a defoliant to destroy jungle where the Viet Cong were hiding. It's still causing birth defects and disabilities 50 years on. What do you think the Vietnamese think about Americans now? Do you think they forgive? I do, yep. And, and on all sides. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you, Chris. Vietnam does feel like it's moving on. And so am I. Back to the station. Vietnamese railways seem seriously short of cash, and accidents are common. So as I embark on the most dangerous stretch of track in the whole country, I've blagged a seat up front with the driver. Hopefully a nice soft seat with a good safety belt. It's another hard chair. Ah, apparently not. Yeah. Thank you. That was me thinking I got away from wooden chairs. Here we are again. Better view, though. How are you? Today, we're heading via the spectacular High Van Pass to Dong Ha, a few miles from what was the demilitarized zone during the Vietnam War. Up ahead, the High Van Pass is a dangerous accident black spot. Thank you. Thank you very much. But first, my drivers must negotiate an even greater safety hazard. Actually, quite a lot of them. Tragically, but fairly predictably, the biggest cause of the very large number of deaths on Viet railways is mainly the level crossings. And it's people on scooters, on motorbikes, motorists and pedestrians just walking across the line. With road crossings every few hundred yards, the driver really has to be on top of his game. His big green button is vital, the horn. I think this driver just lives constantly pressing his horn, just like they do on the roads. People crossing the line are just a constant problem. But they do have, and obviously they are trying to improve their safety record, they do have these attendants, these guys with the flag, anywhere there's any chance of a crossing, official or unofficial, there seems to be an attendant trying to stop people just walking stupidly in front of the railway. So I've never seen such intense concentration. Safely through the suburbs, our next challenge awaits. We're just heading up to the notorious High Van Pass, and as you can see from these guys, they're treating it very, very seriously, slowing right down. The driver's really concentrating, but tragically, in 2005, the driver didn't do that. The driver was running late, going too fast, and the train derailed. 11 people died, and there are over 100, over 100 people were badly injured, and that happened just along here. The pass is 13 miles long, climbing over 1,000 metres above sea level, 
with six tunnels and 18 bridges constructed deep inside dense mountain jungle. We've reached the top, but the most dangerous bit is going back downhill. It's very steep and it's rainy season. What are the biggest problems for you driving trains on these roads? The accident Safely down and through the pass, my driver has a well-earned um, celebration. Here's me talking about health and safety. The driver is smoking. One more level crossing to negotiate, and we've made it safely to Dong Ha. After hours of intense concentration, I finally get a great big smile. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good. Very good. good. Thank you. I'm now in the demilitarised zone, a six-mile no-man's land created to separate North and South in 1954, which suffered extreme bombardment during the war. America's stated aim was to bomb the commies back into the Stone Age. And they reckon that in this one province, Quang Tri, during the Vietnam War, they dropped more bombs than on Germany in the whole of World War II. This area was a vital part of the Viet Cong supply routes known as the Ho Chi Minh Trail. The North Vietnamese went to great lengths to keep these routes operating. None more so than one coastal village that was targeted for sending supplies to an offshore anti-aircraft position. This leads into the village of Vinh Mok, which was particularly heavily bombed. The American idea was to force the villagers to leave the area, but of course, the bombing everywhere was so intense, there was nowhere for them to go, so they went underground. So this is just one of a great complex of tunnels, and this is actually where they lived throughout most of the war. There is one guy who was actually born down here. And I'm hoping to meet him. It's much deeper than I expected. Well, presumably, the farther they could dig down, the more chance there'd be of the bombs hitting the surface and having the same impact. It's really claustrophobic down here. Which one of these is your daddy? This is Tan and his daughter, Hui. He was one of 17 babies born in this tunnel and lived down here until he was five years old. Does he remember the bombing? What, what was it like? Was he, was he frightened? Did he ever see daylight? Did he ever actually go out of this tunnel? Were many people killed who lived in the tunnels? Did some die? Actually, we have uh, more than 400 villagers. They were buried inside 28 tunnels. So they're actually buried alive by the bombs. Can we get some fresh air? <laughs> oh, that's better. We're by the sea. It must have been horrific living down there. Oh, thank you. Can you ask your father, did they realise when they came out, did they realise it was the, the end of the war, the war was over? For Tan and the people of the DMZ, the war may have been over, but the killing didn't stop. 
More than 40,000 Vietnamese have been killed by unexploded bombs since 1975. Oh, I mean. Chris, how are you? Yeah, I'm fine. Thank and today you. I'm going to lend a hand with the ongoing clean-up operation. I must say, I'm a little nervous. Oh, what's this? Yeah, bomb crater. Yeah. That's a bomb crater? Yeah. Yeah, big bomb about uh, the bomb, uh, 500 pound. Huge bomb. Yeah. You sure there's not another bomb? Yeah. This is all clear? Yeah. You promised me? Yeah. Why do I trust you, Mick? Yay. Clearing thousands of unexploded bombs is a slow and dangerous process, but vital in this densely populated country. So where we are now, this is safe, clear? Yeah. And that's 100% safe? Yeah. OK, but over there is unclear. That's, yeah. that's live, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. You can see the, uh, our, our, our team to clear the land. Uh, the first, we used the large loop machine yeah. to find the, the, the signal. Yeah. When uh, they, they, they find signal, they put to the red uh, triangle. They, they, yeah, 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 straight they put a red. marker. Yeah, a and marker. They, and they back off quick, yeah, do they? Yeah, and then the other person used the, the, the volume detector. So I didn't know I was signing up for this. You can use one, 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 one hand. One hand. One hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can. I don't like this. Yeah. No, this is quite. I don't, yeah, just you... stay back. I don't. Yeah. I'm not enjoying this at all. So if I. What's that? That's some more. Some... That was something, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, it's screaming. Yeah, okay. Then we get out of here. Yeah. We confirm there is metal down there. Yeah. And we get the hell out of the way yeah. as soon as possible. Come on, me. Yeah. Let's go back. Yeah. And then your guys would then come in. They would detonate it. Yeah. Yeah. So this area you got marked off. Yeah, yeah. This is a live bomb. Yeah. Uh, you know. Uh, Can I have a look? This are, are we safe here? Yeah. USO item is the mortar, one mortar and one grenade, 40 millimeter. Yeah. And this is typical of the sort of thing you've, you've been finding all this time? Yeah, all the time. Yeah. When we count 10 to 1, you put here. Press so here. it's yeah. not live until I press that, yeah. basically? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Four, Four, three, hi, two, one. one. No. <laughs> I think I expected an explosion. I didn't expect that. God almighty. And in this one province alone, they're finding 40 or 50 of those a day, even now. It's terrifying. Just so pain. once you've cleared it yeah. and it's safe, yeah. then the locals can come back and start using the land. Yeah, yeah. The local people feel uh, safe and then they plant rice and a tree. To date, they've cleared 28 square miles of this region. They have many, many more to clear. Back at the station, once again, I'm boarding the Reunification Express. Tonight, it's the sleeper car for me. Thank you. It's all right, mini bar, or mod cons. Actually, there's no mini bar and there are no mod cons, but there's a sort of softish sort of mattress and a pillow and stuff. So, eight hours before daylight, I'll get my kid off and go to bed. And you're not watching. No, go away. Good night, Vietnam. Tomorrow, I've got one of the seven wonders of the railway world to look forward to. It's the final day of my thousand-mile trek across Vietnam. I've taken the overnight sleeper up to Tan Hoa, where I'm getting off to look at a very special bridge before finishing my journey in Hanoi. Oh, a little bit draggled. I'm now on my way to a place that embodies more than perhaps any other why America just could not win the Vietnam War. Hello. Nice hat. 
Now, this may look like a pretty ordinary bridge, but I can assure you it is not. For a crucial period in the war, the Dragon's Jaw Bridge was indestructible, much to the Americans' frustration. Railway bridges are always an important target. If you can destroy a bridge, the enemy can't use it, and it's much harder to rebuild a whole bridge than just a length of track. But this was number one target for the Americans because the communists were using this bridge as a key point for sending supplies to their Viet Cong guerrillas who were fighting down in the south. The North Vietnamese set up anti-aircraft guns around the bridge and the American onslaught began. 79 planes were sent and the bridge was hit 1,200 times. 1,200 hits and yet the enemy just patched it up and the trains just kept on running. The sheer depth and scale of this crater gives you an idea of just how large the bombs must have been that the Americans were dropping. When the air attacks failed, the Americans came up with a Vietnam War equivalent of the Dam Buster's bouncing bomb a 5,000-pound floating mine with a magnetic detonator that would be triggered when the bomb floated under the bridge. A low-flying Hercules would have come in low, well under the radar, dropped its bombs up there. They would then have floated all the way down here for maybe a quarter of an hour, 20 minutes, until they were right under the bridge. Five bombs were dropped and hit the target just under here where I'm standing. Four out of the five mines exploded, so surely that was finally the end of it. But no, the bridge stayed standing. The next night there was another raid, but a Hercules on a low-level run-in was hit and crashed here and all of the crew were killed. It was another six years before the Dragon's Jaw Bridge was finally broken. In April 1972, it was hit and finally destroyed by one of the first ever laser-guided smart bombs. But by then, the Americans were already starting to pull out, and it was really much too late. So this is the replacement for that original bridge, and it's an emblem of everything about the Vietnam War, the Americans' desire to bomb the North into oblivion, and the communists' incredible desire to survive. And in many ways, both countries lost so much. Three million died. And in the end, for what? The fear of a red planet? Time to move on. In 1975, the communists took Saigon and peace was finally restored. North and South Vietnam ceased to exist once Vietnam became a country again. And bridges like the Dragon's Jaw were quickly rebuilt the whole war-torn line was restored. Just one year later, the railway reopened and was declared the reunification line as a symbol of national unity. It's taken its time, but this train has given me a memorable journey. We're very nearly coming into Hanoi, but I want to jump off one stop early to go and see what some train enthusiasts tell me is the seventh wonder of the railway world. Is it a bridge? Is it a station? No, it's uh, this. I don't know what its real name is, but for fairly obvious reasons, everybody calls this Train Street. The railway lines were built first, and then the company built houses for the railway workers to live in. But why didn't they build the houses just that little bit farther away from the tracks? To find out how the residents cope, I'm talking to this guy who lives at number 24. Hello. I'm Chris. So when you first came here, you're so close to the rails. Were you, were you frightened of being this close to the railway for yourself and your family? Would you have preferred it if you lived a bit farther away from the, from the track? Just check the official timetable. Here it is. <laughs> I love this. In real blue chalk. See, Hanoi to Ho Chi Minh City. These are the ones. 
and then Ho Chi Minh City to Hanoi. It does actually mean that there's a train in about three or four minutes, so we'll go and watch them prepare. I still can't quite get my head around this, but this is the main line into Hanoi, and somehow they will have to stop all this traffic in a couple of minutes' time. 15 times a day, using a car key fob, the train staff dice with death as they close the barriers across the road. So this is the control tower. You just seem to press a little button. What they have to do is make sure all the traffic stops. And as you can see, scooters are still going through at the last minute. The tiniest little gap. Oh, this is so Vietnam. Look at them. It's still coming. This is extraordinary, they're all mad. No wonder so many dinosaurs still look at these. Oh. What I'd like to do now is get myself in the position that it would be like if you lived in one of these houses right by the rail. If I stand here, I stand here. She's saying, mind out, there's a train coming, that lady. Yeah, I know that. That is horribly close. That is scary. Oh. Just imagine living here and having this every few hours of the day, both ways, and through the night. I'm sure they're very attractive properties, but they're the small front garden's a bit of a disappointment. This is so scary. Can you imagine living in one of these houses? And they all seem to love it. Vietnam, you're all bloody mad. Hello. I was just using your front garden to hide from the train. So, back on the train, up to Train Street, the final leg to Hanoi. It does get dark very early this time of year. Crawling to the finish line. And we're here. So this is Hanoi. I've always wanted to come here. Fantastic. This is the capital city now for a population of over 92 million people. Just about every single one of whom seems to be on this road this evening. I've travelled over a 1,000 miles on the Reunification Express. There's a misnomer if ever I heard one, the word express. I've seen no sign of a north-south divide. Now, of course, I'm not going to claim that a train has unified a huge nation, but it is a symbol of a modern, forward-thinking Vietnam. Taxi! Oh, no. OK. Yeah, OK. Uh, I want a car. I was promised a car this time. Yeah, wait a minute. Oh, we've done this. We've done this at the beginning. Go. Yeah. Yeah, very far. What a stretch of limousine. Yeah. 